Welcome to session 15. Uh, my name is Jochen Abele from the Norwegian University of Sciences and Technology. I'll guide you through this session. Uh, session is entitled Sedimentology Related Modeling, Deposit Strati Stratigraphy and Bed Cover. And the first talk will be given by Enrica Viparelli, Modeling Strati Strati Stratigraphy Based uh, Gravel Bed Rivers Morphodynamics. So, please. <laughs> I would like to, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing, I'm sure, yeah, okay, committee for the opportunity of presenting this work here, and my co-authors, Astrid, who is there, and Ricardo, who is not here, and he's a graduate student at the University of South Carolina working on this problem, mostly with laboratory experiments. The problem that we deal with here, here is that in the past decades, numerical models of gravel bed river morphodynamics have been developed and implemented to study fundamental problems such as downstream finding and, uh, for example, gravel sand morphodynamics or gravel sand transitions. More applied problems like dam removal or gravel augmentations, other models have been implemented to study the vertical and streamwise variation of grain size, for example, associated with the migration of bed forms, or the same, the same type of model that store stratigraphy are, have been implemented trying, in the attempt to model dispersers of contaminants or tracers. All these models, and this is what matters here, are based on, have two characteristics in common. One is that they treat the sediment as non-uniform, mostly in terms of non-uniformity of grain size. And the second one is that the interaction between the channel bed and the bed load transport is modeled with some form of an active layer approximation. The question here is if we can do better than this. And I don't know here. To see, let's see what I mean or what we mean with this question. In an active layer model, we have that the bed is divided into two regions, an active layer, which is well mixed, and a substrate whose grain size distribution can vary in space, so in the vertical and in the streamwise direction. The active layer is the portion of the bed that is uh, allowed to exchange sediment with the bed load transport. The sediment fluxes from the substrate is allowed to interact with the sediment flux, with the bed load transport via the active layer during channel bed aggradation. So the channel bed goes up and sediment is transferred from the active layer to the substrate or during channel bed degradation. So when the channel bed goes down and sediment is transferred from the substrate to the active layer. Other sediment flux, vertical sediment fluxes are not modeled. So limitations of active layer based models are that an active layer formulation cannot capture the vertical sediment fluxes, for example, associated with bed for migration. The infiltration of fine sediment cannot be quite well captured. Slowdown of tracers and contaminants. Further, if we want to think in terms of storing stratigraphy, the internal structures of alluvial deposits cannot be reproduced because everything is well mixed. And entrainment and deposition over wider ranges of elevation cannot be modeled. So, to deal with all these limitations in 2000, Parker, Paola, and Leclerc came up with a continuous framework for modeling morphodynamics. This framework is based on the definition of instantaneous realization of bed elevation. So this, the bed elevation changes in, in the eta point, changes in time, and we can define a mean bed elevation eta. Here we focus now on the probability functions of bed elevation fluctuations. And let's see how we can define them. If we draw a line at elevation Z1 within the alluvial, close to the, in the topmost part of the deposit, part of this line is gonna end up in the bed, and part of this line is gonna end up in the water. So the probability of Z1, PE of Z1, denotes the fraction of this line that falls within the bed default deposits or can be interpreted as the probability that an instantaneous realization of bed elevation is higher 
then elevation z1. If we stick with this interpretation of PE, we have that 1 minus P is the probability that the instantaneous bed elevation, the instantaneous realization of bed elevation is smaller than Z1. We take the derivative and we have, if this is a cumulative distribution function, this is going to be a density function, or the probability that our instantaneous realization of bed elevation is at elevation Z1. By definition, the integral between of the PE, so the density function over the entire deposit has to be equal to 1. And here let's note that the limit of integration are happily defined as minus infinity and plus infinity, which simply means deep, in, deep inside in the bed deposit and far away from the channel bed in the water column. And we define the first moment of P in this way, and this represents the uh, mean bed elevation. For this formulation to hold, our fluctuation or our instantaneous realization of bed elevation have to be meaningful, and to be meaningful means that they have to be statistically uniform in space and times over scales that are long compared to the scales of the fluctuations, and are small compared to the scales that control channel bed aggradation and degradation, which means changes in the mean value of bed elevation. So if we want to summarize the difference between an active layer formulation and the continuous framework, we can do that in terms of probabilities that particles get entrained or deposited into the bed low transport. In an active layer model, here we have an active layer, our substrate. The substrate cannot interact with the load. So a probability of entrainment and deposition is a step function with a finite value, which is uniform because the active layer is well mixed just in the topmost part of the bed deposit. Whereas in a continuous framework, we have that our bed elevation fluctuates around the mean value. So in theory, we have continuous functions that describe the probabilities that particles are entrainment in transport or deposited into the channel bed. Thus, this framework has the potential to account for, to model the internal structure of deposits, infiltration of fine material, dispersal of contaminants, and all these things that we cannot properly model with active layer-based models. So this is, we can go back now to our can we do better, and we can rephrase our initial questions in this term. Can we use the probabilistic framework or parker paula leclerc framework at field scale to store stratigraphy of an alluvial deposit? Problems and discussions since 2000 on these questions have been based, the general answer was no, and was no because the computational costs associated to the implementation of the, on the continuous model seem to be too long. And there's another problem, and we're going to see that as we move forward, particularly for the application to gravel bed rivers, is that we have... Um, a large amount of research has been done to develop bed load transport relations. Field-based or equations to predict entrainment and depositions are not readily available. So it's difficult. We have to find a way of using the surface-based load relations developed for, for gravel bed rivers to use entrainment formulations. And we're going to see how we do it. And there is ways of improving whatever we are doing now. And I'm sure of that. Not only this. We also have problems because we don't know what are the shapes of the probability functions of bed elevation, fluctuations, entrainment, and, the, and entrainment. So for this work, we hypothesize some shapes based on information that is available in the literature. Basically, mostly Miguel Swong, PhD thesis. Since we don't have much information on these functions, the shapes, we also don't know how they change with the bed load transport regime or with the sediment transport regime. So to see, to test and see if at least the framework can be applied at field scale, we assume that the probability density functions are steady and uniform, so they don't change in time, the, the time scales of variation in channel bed elevation due to aggradation and degradation are long compared to the 
time scale of adjustment of the bedrock transport regime, so we can get rid of the time dependence and the space dependence here. And the bedrock transport regime does not change during the simulations, so the shape of the probability density functions does not change during the simulations. Okay, those are assumptions that we have to make because there is not much information to do anything better than this yet. Governing equation for these models, for the flow, shallow water equation of mass and momentum balance, with where H is the flow depth, U is the mean flow velocity, T is a temporal coordinate, X stream wise coordinate, CF friction coefficient, and G acceleration of gravity. Quasi steady approximation, we get rid of the time dependence. Mass conservation takes this form per unit channel width. We further assume locally uniform flow because just because this is easy to code, and we get a momentum balance of this form. To compute channel bed aggradation and degradation, we use the divergence form of the x equation, which has this form here, where Cp is 1 minus bed porosity, and If is a flow intermittency factor that accounts for the fraction of time over a year in which our bed is morphologically active. Note here that the divergence flux is computed over the total bed, sh uh, bed load transport rate, which means the bed load transport, the sum of the bed load transport rates in every single grain size range. Now, that's the total, how we deal with the grain size specific equations of conservation of mass. To do that, we have to look at the full grain size distribution of the sediment. This is a cumulative distribution, that is what which is exactly what we do not need in these models. What we need is the fraction of sediment in each characteristic grain size range, pretty much between two bound rate diameters here. The sum of all the fractions has to be equal to one by definition, and we can define a geometric mean diameter of the particles, which is a characteristic grain size that we will be using to look at our results later on. Now, in an active layer model, the grain size specific equation of conservation of sediment in the bed material simply states that the time rate of change of particles in a certain grain size range in the active layer is equal to the net, ero net flux of particles due to bed load transport plus the vertical fluxes associated with channel bed aggradation and degradation. What is, what is important here for this talk is how we compute the grain size distribution of the sediment transferred from the active layer to the substrate during channel bed aggradation and to the, from the substrate to the active layer during channel bed degradation. What we implement is an act, a Huey Ferguson formulation where we have this magic alpha parameter here in the case of channel bed uh, aggradation which tells us that the grain size distribution of the sediment transferred to the substrate during aggradation is a weighted average between the fraction of sediment in that grain size range in the active layer and in the load. In the case of erosion, just substrate material goes in the active layer. If we want to store stratigraphy with this type of model, well, we put a grid with different nodes during channel bed aggradation. Note the uppermost point of the grid is at the interface between the active layer and the substrate where we have a sharp discontinuity in the probability of entrainment function. During channel bed degradation, we add new points where it's needed and our upper line of points of the grid follows the active layer substrate interface. During channel bed degradation, everything goes down and sediment gets removed from the grid. How do we do the grain size specific conservation of material in the case of a probabilistic model? At, so the probabilistic model is a continuous model. So we have to start with the conservation of bed material at a given elevation z. And here is the form. The time rate of change of sediment in the generic grain size range fi at elevation z in the deposit is equal to entrainment deposition minus entrainment. And again, we have an intermittency factor here just to account for the fraction of time that our channel is morphologically active. If we integrate this equation over the entire bed deposit, we find that the total uh, change in uh, sediment in each grain size distribution in the deposit is equal to the net entrainment or deposition rate, di, ei. This ei and ezi here are elevation dependent, 
when we integrate them over the deposit, they're just a function of space, meaning streamwise direction and time. And this is important, because we have to link the entrainment to the bed load transport flux. Now, how can we do that? At time t1, we have a sediment particle that is resting on the channel bed. At some point in time, it gets entrained in transport, saltates, rolls, slides, and then it finds its new rest place at a distance lambda from the original place. We can say that lambda, this lambda can be an average distance or an average step length of the particle, or particles can move larger distances, smaller distances, and so the step length can be modeled with, in terms of a probability density function of step lengths. Let's write the position and load in terms of, in, with a generic form, so in terms of probability density functions, and then we're gonna simplify the problem for our case. Then the position rate of sediment across section X is equal to the sum of all the particles that are entrained into bed load transport upstream of our point X and are deposited at X. This is what this integral means. The load at X is equal to the sum of all the particles that are entrained in transport somewhere upstream of X and they're transported further downstream. And this is what this double integral means. If our fraction, of, if our uh, step length is constant, these two equations simplify. In this form, the position is equal to the entrainment, one step length upstream, and load becomes just one single integral. At mobile bed equilibrium, and this is from Einstein's work, entrainment is constant everywhere. The load can be expressed simply as the product of the entrainment rate times lambda, and this is the formulation that we are using in our simulations. We can implement more complex formulations later on, but as a first attempt, we go with the simple things. So, now we know we have one more problem. The load, which is related to the entrainment in this way, is computed with a surface-based formulation. Now, what is the bed surface in this problem? Again, to simplify things, we say that it's simply the integral of the fraction of sediment at whatever elevation z times the probability density of bed elevation. And again, we integrate over the entire deposit. Based on new recent, recent work by Anna Pelosi, this form can be, this definition can also be written in terms of probability of entrainment, but for now we stick to the simple one. Problem, how do we solve our equation? To do this, we do what? Parker, Paula, and Leclerc did in 2000. We define a boundary attached vertical coordinate y as z minus eta, where eta is the mean bed elevation function of time, and we know how to compute it. In this, for, in this new c coordinate system, the probability of bed elevation fluctuations, and as well as the fraction of sediment at each grain size range, are a function of space and time in this form. We can take this derivative, we get this equation here. Fine, how do we solve that? Look on this side, we first have to define, let's go with the easy part, which is this one. Entrainment and deposition. We know how to compute di and ei, the total. We define them, the elevation specific deposition of entrainment as the, pro as the product between the total entrainment rate at that cross section x times a probability of deposition at elevation y. And the entrainment rate is the same thing, the total times a probability of entrainment at elevation y. So if we sum this equation over all the grain sizes, we find an equation here where we have probability of bed elevation fluctuations, sum of the deposition, and sum of the entrainment. If we assume now that p is steady, which is what we said at the beginning, we assume that these functions are steady because we don't, cannot do much better now, we get rid of the time dependence of the probability function of bed elevation fluctuations, and we get with this form. So the sum of the grain size specific bed load flux, the divergence of the grain size specific bed load fluxes times the probability density of bed elevation, a generic elevation z, is equal to the sum of the deposition and the entrainment at the same elevation. If we write this equation in each grain size range, we find here a relation between 
the three probability density functions. And let's see how this relation looks like. Recalling that if the step length is much, much smaller than our uh, length scale in the down channel direction, the divergence of the bed load flux in the generic grain size range is equal to the entrainment minus deposition. You're substituting this relation in here and solving for the grain size specific probability of deposition, we find that the probability, the grain size specific probability of deposition is a function of the probability of entrainment and the probability of bed elevation fluctuations, entrainment rate, and deposition rate. Whatever can be size specific here is size specific. At mobile bed equilibrium, when entrainment is equal to deposition, we find that the probability of deposition is equal to the probability of entrainment, and this makes perfect sense. Now, we still have to solve this thing here. Recalling, we using this result, and recalling that the time rate of change of the mean bed elevation is equal to divergence of the total, which means summed over all grain sizes, the uh, bed load transport rate, and that in each grain size range, the divergence of the grain size specific bed load transport flux is equal to entrainment minus deposition. We substitute everything in this equation here, and we find an equation that allows us to compute at every elevation the time rate of change of the sediment uh, in each, of the fraction of, of the volume fraction of sediment in each grain size range. Note that for the assumption of steady bed elevation fluctuations, this relation is not dependent on the grain size specific probability of entrainment or on the grain size specific probability of deposition. Okay, does this work? And how does this work? To answer this question, we take a 20 kilometer long reach of the Trinity River in California. The choice of the river reach is done because I had the field data. And we do zeroing runs, which are the not exciting runs, because are runs that you do at the beginning when you want to see if a model works and gives reasonable results. So we start from an invented initial condition. We have a feed rate, which was estimated in different ways on the Trinity River. We have a flow rate, which was estimated in some way, was, well, which was measured at the old bridge here on the Trinity River. We do pre-dams conditions. So we pretend that Lewiston Dam and Trinity Dam do not exist. And we have a downstream end of the model ridge somewhere 20 kilometers down here from the Lewiston, from the new bridge. And we see how the bed elevation changes. This is our grain size distribution. We have a geometric mean diameter of 16 millimeters, a geometric standard deviation of 5.13. A pre dam channel width was estimated with Dave Gauman from the Trinity River Restoration Project equal to 75 meters, flow rate 368 cubic meters per second. Friction coefficient of 12 is calibrated on previous run that we have done working on gravel coarse gravel augmentations on this river stretch. Sediment input rate, again, based on the same previous work, 24,000 tons per year, and this is just bed material. We have an initial slope of 0 0.01. We have to equilibrate with a slope of 0 0.024. Those are the zeroing runs. Active layer model runs, it takes about 5,000 years to reach mobile bed equilibrium. The black line is our initial condition. This is the transient evolution of the long profile. The blue line here is the final bed elevation. We have a rotation of the longitudinal profile around the downstream end because this is a normal flow, a locally normal flow model. So our downstream boundary condition is a specified bed elevation here. So we have a rotation around that point. And if we look at the final slope, we have 50 meters over 20 kilometers, which is close enough to 0 0.0024. Uh, mean annual total bed material load, it equilibrates to our, this, is, this black line again is the initial condition, non-armored bed, drops, we equilibrate at our pre-dam estimate of the bed load transport rate. Mean annual 
Geometric mean diameter, we start with fine material over the unarmored surface, we go back here, we equilibrate at our 16 millimeter diameter, which is what this type of model should do. And bed surface, again, we start with non-armored surface, 16 millimeters, and an armor layer develops, grows, and we equilibrate with a grain size between 50 and 60 millimeter that has pre damped value, again, based on work of Dave Gaumann and of the people from the Trinity River Restoration Project, was declared to be an acceptable estimate. Okay, how does the probabilist, oh no, one more. This is a stratigraphy-based talk. This is the grain size distribution of sediment in the bed deposit. The green part is our 16 millimeter initial substrate. The yellow part is our new substrate. Note that it's between, as a grain size that vary between 18 and 22 millimeters. In terms of geometric mean diameter, close enough given all the simplifications that we have done. Computational time, 20 minutes. Let's see what happens with the probabilistic framework. Again, initial bed elevation, a gradation, we get a final slope, again, 50 meters over 20 kilometers, good enough. The time, though, to reach equilibrium is much, much longer. And we have to see why. Because this can seem a consequence of having assumed the fluctuations, and I don't think that that's the case. Uh, this is the results of simulations that we have done assuming a normal distribution with 500 millimeter standard deviations. We have also tried log normal distribution for PE and the standard deviations in both cases were varying from uh, three grain sizes to half a meter, just to see what was the effect. And there was nothing substantial here. Again, the model is a surface-based model we have that we can get at equilibrium, we match the imposed load and imposed mean, uh, geometric mean diameter of the load. And here is, okay, here again, we get the same diameter of the bed surface as it should do, but here we have a problem. The grain size distribution that this model is predicting is much, much coarser than the grain size distribution of the original substrate. The runtime, though, good news, it's just two hours, which means that this is something that, if improved, can work at field scale. Now, if we compare this result, though, and this is interesting, with the results of an active layer model in which our magic alpha to compute the fraction of sediment transferred from the active layer model to the substrate is equal to one. So we don't transfer bed load material to the bed. We just transfer active layer material, which is the original formulation of the active layer model, we get, again, 10,000 years to get to conditions of equilibrium and pretty much the same substrate. So what, I sus what we suspect is that the assumptions of DPE DT equals zero reduce, in certain, some form, the stratigraphy-based results of the probabilistic framework to the original case of the active layer model. Uh, so conclusions. If the probability density of bed elevation fluctuations is steady and uniform, the elevation-specific equation of conservation of bed material does not depend on probability of entrainment and deposition. The Parker, Paula, Leclerc framework for sediment continuity is not too computationally expensive for field-scale applications. The active layer and the probabilistic framework predict the same results in terms of equilibrium, bed slope, geometric mean diameter of the bed surface. The temporal scales of evolution of the model domain and its grain size stratigraphy predicted with the parker paula Leclerc framework are almost identical to the original active layer model in which just active layer material was transferred to the substrate. And this is probably related to the assumption of steady bed elevation, distribution of bed elevation fluctuations, which will be relaxed in the near future. And as soon as we do this, we're going to start have to worrying on how to specify probability of entrainment and dependence of probability of entrainment on grain size and elevation and elevation fluctuations, which means bed low transport regime. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. The second talk will be by uh, Rebecca Hodge and will be on sediment processes in bedrock alluvial rivers.
research since 2010 and modeling the impact of fluctuating sediment supply on sediment cover. Sorry, I had to read this. This was very long. <laughs> Not exactly the snappiest of titles. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation to talk here. Um, and it's also really nice to see bedrock alluvial rivers. Sorry, am I? Okay. So it's really nice to see bedrock alluvial rivers sort of incorporated into this schedule. Um, and cause hopefully you'll see actually sitting through the talk so far this week, there's been quite a lot, a lot of topics that have come up that actually have sort of direct um, analogies and have sort of are issues that are currently debated in the bedrock alluvial river. So hopefully some of the things that I'll cover today will be of sort of wider interest. So like my chapter, this is a bit of a talk of two halves. I want to start by thinking a bit about sort of what makes bedrock alluvial rivers a bit different um, to sort of standard gravel bed rivers. Um, and also thinking about kind of what's happened in this research area since 2010. So Jens did a really nice summary paper sort of five years ago. So kind of, you know, what are the big questions that have been sort of addressed since then? But I also kind of want to look forward and say, okay, well, what do we need to do? You know, hopefully in five years' time, what are the things that someone's going to stand up and say, these are the things that have now been addressed? In the second half of the talk, I'm going to take one of these questions and I'm going to show you an example of how we can use a really quite a simple modeling framework to try and address this question of how bedrock rivers might respond, in particular the sediment cover, um, to fluctuating sediment supply. So if we think about what a sort of bedrock, um, standard alluvial river looks like, you're probably very used to seeing diagrams which have a form like this. So we've got this sort of interrelationship between channel morphology, um, flow, and sediment transport. And then we've got the external controls of both sediment supply and discharge. And then there's probably also going to be some sort of relationship between discharge and sediment supply. However, if we think about a bedrock alluvial river, these relationships start to get a little bit more complicated. So instead of a single channel morphology here, we've now got sort of two different phases. So we've got the more resistant bedrock morphology, and then we've also got a more transient sediment cover. And it did occur to me that you could maybe see this not necessarily as being two different things, but it could almost be a continuum with things like sort of step pull systems or systems with immobile boulders actually sitting in the middle of those two. So in bedrock alluvial systems, the alluvial cover typically can respond over quite short time scales. So you may well get cover changing over the, um, the duration of a single flow event. However, we've also kind of got a second time scale that operates in this system, and that's the time scale over which that, the bedrock morphology itself um, is eroded and evolves. And this has this additional controlling factor of the bedrock geology. And the reason that this is so slow is either because bedrock erosion occurs really slowly, or it's because bedrock erosion only really occurs during very few, very infrequent um, large magnitude events. So the fact that the bedrock erosion sort of occurs slowly and potentially largely occurs during very large events means that you could actually say that this bedrock morphology is in some ways out of equilibrium with the sort of standard flow conditions that occur within these channels most of the time. So I guess what I want to talk about today is the way that if we want to understand um, sediment dynamics in these bedrock alluvial systems, we very much need to understand it sort of within this context. So what I'm going to do is talk about some of these different relationships within bedrock alluvial systems and some of the work that's been done to try to understand them. So first of all, if we think about bedrock alluvial channels, we want to think about how, how sediment transported within these channels. And if we think about sediment grains in a bedrock alluvial system, at a very sort of simple approximation, there's two locations that those sediment grains can be in. They can either be sort of within an alluvial patch on the bed, or they can actually be isolated grains on an area of bedrock. And using a very simple sort of force balance model here and approximating those underlying surfaces by a series of spheres, we can predict the shear stress that would be required to entrain grains in those different locations. And what we see here, this is relative grain size, this is shear stress, so typically, grains in the alluvial patches are entrained at about an order of magnitude higher shear stress than the grains on the bedrock surface. So that bedrock surface is really enhancing the mobility of the sediment. We also find that the bedrock morphology can affect 
both the, also the entrainment of brains and the size selectivity of that transport. So some work by Goody and Wall showed that, again, the location of the grains on the bed in relation to these bedrock ribs determined both how easily those grains were entrained and the orientation of the ribs also determined whether or not that entrainment was size selective. Um, Siddiqui and Robert have also demonstrated that actually in a, a bedrock alluvial river with quite high sediment cover, you actually do get size dependent um, sediment transport, much as you would expect to see in an alluvial system. However, if you look at the sort of spectrum of bedrock alluvial systems such as here, We've got the Alpe du Baig, which is a sort of, um, we're losing as an alluvial example, which has got similar properties to the River Calder down here. So we've got the South Fork Eel with 80% um, sediment cover, the Calder with 20% cover. And we can see that in the Alpe du Baig, from these tracer study data, we've got very strong size dependence between travel distance on this axis here and grain size here. South Fork Eel, we again see the similar size dependence. But in the River Calder, across events of a range of different sizes, we don't seem to get any size dependence in that transport. It seems that all grain sizes seem to be equally mobile. We hypothesize that, again, this is that influence of the bedrock surfaces instead of increasing grain mobility. And the fact that sediment grains move very readily across these bedrock surfaces may well mean that actually once sediment starts into motion, the virtual velocities are going to be a lot higher than they are in alluvial systems. And again, comparing the River Calder and the Alpe du Baig, we, we see that. So again, this is grain size, and we've got virtual velocity. And the River Calder is sort of at least twice that that we see in the Alpe du Baig. And we could hypothesize that actually this could mean that bed load fluxes in bedrock alluvial systems will also be a lot higher because we've got this high virtual velocity. But clearly, this is in some ways going to be tempered by the fact that bedrock alluvial systems are, by definition, um, sort of undersupplied with sediment, and so the total sediment supply will be less. The fact that we've got this very difference in sediment entrainment um, between the bedrock areas of the bed and the alluvial areas of the bed means that sediment tends to accumulate in sediment patches. So this is some of the, my work here. And if we think about, if we start with a small number of grains scattered on a bedrock surface, we've got a small number of grains that are very mobile, and those gray grains have got a very high probability of movement. Once we start adding grains onto that surface, the grains start to cluster together, and they start sort of accumulating. And each of those grains is going to have more neighbors. So in this example here, a grain that's blue has more than five neighboring cells that also contain grains. And those neighboring grains are going to have sort of two effects on the mobility of the grain. It's also going to have a geometric effect. It's going to alter the pivoting angle of that grain. It's going to alter the exposure of that grain. And this is going to make that grain harder to move. It's also going to affect the local flow conditions, because in this case here, it's actually going to make the bed rougher. And it's also going to decrease the local shear stress. So because of that, we make those grains less mobile. And once you've got grains that are less mobile, those sediment patches basically will grow and start to stabilize. And ultimately, if you add enough grains, you eventually get a fully alluvial bed. And work by Nelson and Seminara has also shown sort of very similar process, but was from a slightly different modeling viewpoint. Some experimental work and also theoretical work has demonstrated that because of this sort of nonlinear feedback between sort of isolated grains and sediment grain and sort of clustered grains, you can get very rapid transition between a fully bedrock bed and a bed that's fully covered by sediment. So for example, the flume work and by Chan Tarvat and Parker demonstrated that this is sediment flux on this axis, this is bed exposure. Up to a certain sediment flux, you get full bed exposure. And then you get enough sediment that you start to get the interactions between the grains. And then you get a very rapid transition to full sediment cover down here. So clearly, these interactions between grains on bedrock surfaces are going to be really quite important in determining the amount of sediment cover that we get in a bedrock system. But if we go and look at a bedrock channel, such as this one here, this is the River Gary, you can see that we've got this accumulation of sediment here. But also, that's grain interactions are not the only thing determining where that sediment patch is. Although it looks like a fairly flat surface, there's clearly a little bit of relief on that surface. And you can see that the sediment tends to accumulate in the lower areas of the bed. 
So clearly bedrock morphology is also something that we need to think about. So some of the work um, by Johnson and Whipple did some flume experiments, and this very nicely demonstrated that in an example where you've got a slot canyon forming, the sediment cover naturally tends to form along the bottom of the bed. So this is bed elevation, and this is the pattern of sediment cover that they demonstrated in their flume. So that's maybe quite an extreme example. We've got quite a lot of sort of topographic variation on the bed. Um, but some other work, sort of both theoretical and modeling work, has shown that even with smaller irregularities on the bed, that also affects the way in which sediment cover develops. So again, the flume experiments of Chanatarvit and Parker, they found that if they put boulders on the bed, instead of this very rapid transition between full bed exposure and full bed cover, they actually get a more linear transition like this one here. And that's because of the influences of the boulder on the flow in terms of creating wake zones in which sediment patches um, can start to develop. And then um, in UA et al. have also sort of tried to use this to develop a, a relationship between sediment flux and sediment cover. Okay, so that's a sort of very brief whistle-stop tour through some of the sort of ways in which these bedrock alluvial rivers are slightly different um, to some of the sort of fully alluvial rivers. And what I tried to do in the paper was try and say, okay, well, let's look at all the research that's been done since 2010, and let's try and sort of think about what questions this research has been trying to answer, and sort of what issues it's been addressed. So you've got a range of sort of areas down here that increase in scale, and also trying to think about what approaches have people taken to answering these particular research questions. Um, so we've got physical models, numerical models, and field data there. What's quite notable, actually, if you look at a lot of this work, so this is just the sort of smaller scale portion of the work, a lot, a sort of key driving factor for quite a lot of these papers has been the saltation abrasion model that Sklar and Dietrich developed um, in 2004. And it would just be useful just to sort of recap this model briefly. This is the idea that basically a sediment bed is eroded by grains that are saltating across that bed. And what they did was try to identify how that erosion rate would changes as a function of sediment input. So we've got sediment transport on this axis here. And what they found was that if you put more grains into the bed, you get more saltating grains. So the rate at which those grains impact the bed will go up. However, if you put more sediment through the system, the amount of the bed that's exposed is going to decrease because you'll get more sediment cover, more sediment patches forming. Under constant flow conditions, the dynamics of those saltations will be the same. So the amount of the bedrock that's eroded by each impact will remain the same. And when you multiply those three together, you basically get this, um, this sort of humped erosion function with maximum erosion occurring at sort of intermediate um, sediment transport rates. And what a lot of work has done has, has taken this model, and there's a really sort of been an explosion of, on papers trying to take this model and trying to improve it, or trying to add sort of extra parameters into it. So, for example, there's been work looking at what happens if you don't have a flat bed and you actually have convex bed forms on your bed. Um, or what about sort of trying to incorporate the impact on grain scale roughness on those interactions between the flow and the sediment transport? Okay. So that's quite a lot, sort of a lot of the motivation that's driven that smaller scale work. Um, I don't really want to touch upon this in much detail here, but sort of in the paper, I also consider kind of the work that's been done at larger scales. So thinking about how all those different arrows in that diagram, how they all interrelax over both sort of event to annual time scales, and also over this, how they interact over sort of geological time scales, and thinking about how bedrock um, incision basically sort of operates in the, let's concept, in the context of landscape evolution. And then the final area here is flow, because although this really seems to be a key part of that diagram, it's actually something that seems to be remarkably under, sort of, underrepresented in the bedrock literature. So having constructed this diagram, we're then to, okay, so where are the gaps in this diagram? You know, what are the key questions that we really need to be asking sort of in the future over the next five years? So it seems that one of these is this area of sediment cover. As you can see here, we've got a lot of numerical and analytical models for how we think sediment cover develops in these sorts of systems. 
But we really actually have remarkably little field data with which to try and test these models. The fact that this box is blank is not quite strictly accurate because some of these other papers do actually have, um, do actually have field data of sediment cover within them. It's just that often that's not been the main um, form of the data. And I've also, I also have to apologize to maybe Jens that this is only up to the end of 2014 and I know there are a couple of papers that have come out in 2015 that maybe do start to fill in that box. But clearly this question of sediment cover is something that has quite a lot of gaps in our knowledge. Flow is another area. Again, we know, seem to know very little about how flow operates in these bedrock alluvial systems. There is some data prior to 2010, but again, it's quite sporadic. It's only from a few examples. You know, and there's only really been sort of two key papers that have actually come out in the last 10 years, um, one of Venditti and one of Van, sorry, the last five years. Another question that kind of links back to quite a lot of, particularly what Mikhail was talking about sort of earlier this week, this question about sediment supply and how does sediment supply drive these bedrock alluvial systems? And kind of how does the importance of sediment supply vary from the scale of grain scale dynamics through to these sort of geological timescales that um, a lot of landscape dynamicists are interested in? And then finally is this question about upscaling. As I said, a lot of this sort of smaller scale research has really been motivated by trying to improve the saltation abrasion model, trying to add additional terms into it. But if we're trying to model these sorts of systems over geological timescales, frankly, we've no idea what the sediment flux is, what the discharge is, what really sort of large scale boundary conditions are in terms of that we would put into our models. So is it really useful to actually be trying to worry about the morphology of the bed and whether we've got a flat bed or a smooth bed? You know, what's an appropriate level of process representation that we need to take from this scale in order to apply models of that larger scale? And I guess just to sort of recap through these questions, the questions about sediment cover, we need to know, you know, what are the control on the extent of the cover, where that occurs on the bed and the spatial pattern? How does it um, change in response to controlling factors? You know, what are those interactions between the sediment cover and the morphological development? You know, and always, can you turn that on its head and say, okay, let's, can we look at a channel morphology and actually infer something about the long tail pattern of um, sediment supply to that channel? What are the hydraulics characteristics of flow in bedrock alluvial systems? And frankly, how do we quantify flow resistance? I know um, some of the people in this room have started to do some work on this problem, but again, it's still not really been very thoroughly tested. And what impacts does sediment cover have on hydraulic roughness? And clearly this is also going to depend on what the bedrock morphology is, whether we have a smooth bed or whether we have a rough bed. Okay, and then this is the question that I'm going to come back to in a couple of slides time. Again, sediment supply, is there a typical sediment supply regime? You know, what are the controls on magnitude, frequency and grain size distribution? So again, linking back to a lot of the earlier discussion. And then finally, upscaling, how does the importance of those different factors vary according to the level of interest and the level of processes that we're trying to represent? Okay, so in the second half of this talk, I want to show you a particular example of how we can use a modeling framework to answer this question of how sediment cover varies in response to changing sediment supply. And quite a lot of the previous research has often assumed that sediment cover is at least in equilibrium with the kind of local sediment supply. And it seems to be in a lot of rivers, this is not necessarily going to be the case. So this is going to use a very simple modeling framework. And this is the cellular automata model that I've been developing. So this is the model. And what happens is in each time step, we feed grains into the top of the model. There's a bit of surface smoothing just to avoid sort of very extreme irregularities in the surface. The grains are entrained. Every grain is then transported one step length, and they're deposited downstream. Any models that leave the model are just removed from the model domain. And again, we've got these two different colors. So we've got the, low prob the grains with a high probability of movement, which are the gray grains with relatively few neighbors, and the blue ones, which have got a low probability of movement, which are the grains with several neighbors. And again, this is reflecting of the, the, the impact of those grain interactions on both um, sediment geometry, but also the local flow. 
The other thing to say is we're not explicitly modeling flow in this model. The only way in which flow is represented is through this impact on the different differential sediment entrainment. Okay, so previous research that I've done with using this model, we've just run it under a steady sediment flux and we've looked at how the sediment cover evolves. So this is sediment flux on this axis. This is fractional bedrock exposure. So this is full exposure. This is full sediment cover. And again, we've got these three examples of how that bed surface develops in response to those ch that change in sediment flux. If you change the parameter values, so we change the probabilities for these gray grains and these blue grains, you actually get a range of different relationships um, between bedrock exposure and sediment flux. And this is actually quite a pleasing result because the range of relationships that we see are actually really quite similar to the range of relationships that have been developed both through other theoretical studies and but also in flume studies. So it suggests that this really simple model is actually beginning to sort of capture some of the, the essence or the sort of key processes that are going on within these types of systems. So for the model runs I want to show you here, we've been using a variable sediment input. And the way we've been developing this variable set and input is using a sort of power law distribution. So this is actually the distribution of flow that was developed, I think, for the EROS model by Philip Davy. So the, EROS, the distribution we're using has got three, a key parameter called K. Basically, when K is two, we get a very low variability within our discharges. When K is 0.5, we get the highest variability in our discharges. And roughly, this is sort of equivalent to a temperate river. This is more equivalent to a sort of monsoonal system. You can then say, OK, well, actually, maybe sediment inputs, it's not just related to the variation in flow. It's actually maybe a nonlinear function of that. So we've got a second set of distributions that we created that take these three initial distributions and then basically say, OK, let's approximate it as a sort of um, a square function. So we're going to square them and then rescale them so we get an extra three distributions. And those second three distributions give us a more variable um, range of inputs. So I'll set a parameter space here. We go from the least variable here to the most variable up here. And these are, again, distributions here. And the key thing is that that red line is when the distribution is equal to the mean sediment input, the mean long-term sediment input. So you can see most of the time the sediment input is a lot less than the mean. And a small proportion of the time it's greater than the mean. And kind of what these example of what these look like, again, this is our least variable one. You can see we're ranging from values of about 0 up to 25. This is the most variable one. Most of the time, we've got variables of 0. and occasion, we've got a value of about 5,000. So basically, these are weighting factors that we use to weight by the average sediment input for that particular model run. OK, so they've got seven sets of model runs one with each of those six distributions, and the seventh set where we've got constant sediment input. And then within each of those sets of runs, we've got eight runs using one of eight different um, long-term average sediment inputs. So in all, we've got 20,000 time steps in each run, which is a lot longer than the constant sediment inputs take to come to an equilibrium condition. We've got an active layer, which means that all models have the same effective constant transport capacity. The model domain length is 100 steps. And this is basically the relationship that we get under constant sediment flux between sediment cover um, and sediment flux. OK, so if we have a look and see what these model runs look like, this is using the least variable sediment input. So in each of these diagrams, um, the, gray, the brown grains are sediment cover, and the paler ones are the exposed bedrock surface. This is the low average sediment flux. This is the high average sediment flux. And like I say, this is the least variable one. So you can see at the upstream end, we've got a bit of pulsing of the sediment input. But if you look at the downstream end, you can see there's actually very little variation in the sediment cover. We've got low cover here, high cover here. And these sort of upstream variations have basically been smoothed out and removed. If, however, we look at the most variable example, again, this is a small long-term average flux. This is a large long-term average flux. You can see that actually we get quite similar behaviors between those different model runs. We have long periods of time where we've got no sediment cover, 
and then you get a flux, an imp a flux of input in each of those runs at about the same time. And in this one here, the pulses take longer to get to the bottom of the model, model domain. But in every case at the downstream end, we've got this fluctuation between sediment cover um, and, sed and bedrock exposure. And we don't get the same sort of smoothing out that we did in the previous example. Oh, OK. So, OK, so if we have a look at these relationships between bedrock exposure and time steps, this is the example um, of the reference runs. If we start increasing the variability a bit more, we get a bit of scatter. If we increase it even more, you can see we get more scatter, particularly this threshold state here. And in this case here, we actually get something which looks very dissimilar to the sort of other example. And you can see that actually, there's actually quite little variation in the patterns of cover between these different sediment fluxes. And like I say, we get this, this model seems to be most sensitive to the fluctuation of inputs within these sort of intermediate sediment input rates. And just a quick example to again to sort of demonstrate that variability. You can see in this case here, we've got constant sediment cover. In this case here, the most variable sediment input, we've got this sort of pulses of sediment moving down the system. So the key finding seems to be that we've actually got two different cover regimes here. We've got this sort of similar cover to constant sediment input, whereby the system seems to be able to damp out the variations. However, if we really increase the variability of that input, we get this sort of binary sediment cover, where we either get full sediment cover or we get very little sediment cover. And we get these most fluctuations at these sort of intermediate sediment fluxes. We can see that we've got this sort of downstream variation in cover. So in this case here, the gray line is the upstream variation, and the thin black line is the downstream variation. And you can see that we've got a lot of variation upstream, but less variation downstream. You can also see we've got these sort of sediment pulses that are moving down the system. So this is downstream distance. And each one of these lines shows the amount of sediment cover. And they're stacked over different time steps. And you can see that in this case here, where we've got low variation, the sediment pulse sort of disperses and is dissipated downstream. Whereas in this case here, the sediment pulses are actually managed to be transmitted to the bottom of the model. So we still see their effect at the downstream end. So we've got these sort of two different regimes, and it seems that we've got this variation between this regime where the grain-grain interactions are determining the sediment cover, and this sort of regime here where it's very much that variation in sediment supply that's sort of overriding the impact of those grain-grain interactions. And it seems that over the first regime, those grain-grain interactions can actually buffer the system to some extent against those variations in sediment input. Most fluctuation seems to occur between this sort of transition that we get between full cover and full exposure in the, um, in the sort of control runs. And it's because of this fact that if you put in a little bit more sediment, you create more cluster grains, which makes the bed more stable. And so you can get very rapid transitions between um, bed exposure and bed cover. And then we've also shown that the sort of upstream sediment storage, these pulses that you can see in the model, actually seem to dampen that sort of downstream variability. So it is a simple model with limited process representation, but it yet produces multiple behaviors um, that seem to be sort of realistic. We said grain-grain interactions can mediate against these variations in sediment supply. And it's also worth noting this is a ratio of the maximum, the maximum input to the average input, so the median input. And basically, the maximum has to be about 50,000 times larger than the median before we sort of transition to that pulsed regime. And we've shown that the variability of sediment cover, it seems to be sort of damped out over really quite short distances. This model domain is only 100 step lengths long. So it seems to be that variation of sediment cover, we could argue from this model that it's maybe only locally important unless that variation is very large. But, there's always a but, how variable is sediment input in rivers? You know, how do those mod numbers in the table on the previous slide actually compare to what we see in a real river system? Clearly, there's no flow in this model. So at the moment, the transport capacity of that flume is the same at every time step in the model. And clearly, that's probably not a realistic assumption. So you know, I guess there's a question about what happens if you do vary the transport capacity as a function of some sort of flow that's also um, imposed in that model.
this question about how ca can grain entrainment be parameterized? You know, is a binary system the best way of doing it? And I have to, I've just put this up. This is some other work that we're doing, looking at um, using CT scanning to look at sort of sediment structure and hopefully to trying to parameterize grain entrainment through a riffle pool sequence. You know, and do we need to sort of know these grain properties, sort of grain structural properties within these sorts of systems? And then finally, what if the bed is not flat? Again, these are some other flume experiments we've been doing using 3D printing to represent a real sediment, a real bedrock topography. You know, what impact does that have on the way in which this sediment cover forms? Um, and I'll leave you with my conclusion slides there. So thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Can you join up? I guess there will be some questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to Enrica. Uh, you, uh, do you take in account, uh, I, I miss maybe, maybe the way you take in account the, part, the capacity of transport of the different sizes? Do you use a hiding function? Do you use, so you do use a hiding function or something with that? I experienced some, this sort of calculation, but it was the classical mixing layer. Are you sure that the parameters you put in the description of yeah, the distribution function is compatible to the uh, way you take into account the mixing layer? Yeah, that is that uh, you get some inertia with the size of the, the distribution of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the of the, the sediment in the vertical, and at the same time, the, mic, the, the, the hiding coefficient take into account of s the same processes of hiding. Do they can they work all together? And after that, I will have a second question, short, about the upstream boundary condition and the lambda effect. Okay, okay. let's start. I try to go in order here. <clears throat> First, you have whatever channel bed, right? You compute the flow, you get a bed shear stress, you have an initial or whatever realization of grain size distribution of the bed surface at some time t that we compute integrating the grain size specific elevation volume fraction of each size range over the entire depositing and weighting it over the probability <clears throat> density function of bed elevation fluctuations. So we have a surface, we have a shear stress, we use Wilcock and Crow, and I forgot to say this and I apologize, and we get a bed load transport rate. Got the bed load transport rate, we convert it into an entrainment rate using E times lambda, which is the cheapest and dirtiest thing we can do, otherwise we have to go with the integrals, but that's it, can be done. It's just computationally a little bit more expensive. So we get the entrainment. That's how we get the entrainment. So we use a Wilcock and Crow formulation, which is the same Wilcock, Wilcock and Crow relation that we have formed, the Wilcock and Crow relation that we have calibrated on the Trinity River in 2011 when we worked on uh, coarse grain size augmentations uh, associated with uh, controlled flow releases from the dams to improve the volume of the spawning gravel. So that's how we get the sediment flux. Now, the prob no, this is a gravel bed river. Miguel Wong has done experiments on lower regime plain bed, and he has measured probability distributions of bed elevation fluctuations with sonars at SAFO, and he has done tracer studies at flume scale on this bed low transport regime. I don't think it's too horrible to assume that bed lower regime may work in this case, and so this is the reason why we have used his probability density functions to model bed elevation fluctuations, assuming to be as consistent as we can. We have also done two runs with a log normal distribution to account for a non for an asymmetry of the distribution function, and in both cases we have scaled the standard deviations with grain size, 3D, so the 48 millimeter, and with the half a meter to say there's something bigger that is moving, and the overall results did not change significantly. So the problem of the core, too much sediment, 
towards cross sediment is being transferred to the substrate. There was uh, some addition concerning the upstream. Oh, addition. the lambda. Yes, uh, the lambda. Uh, Anna that Pelosi and Gary have done the simulations and have shown that if uh, lambda scales with grain size, right? So if I have a one kilometer ridge, lambda times z is much, much smaller than one kilometer, so it doesn't play much. Role. Yes, so uh, how does it work with unsteady boundary condition? Uh, is it numerical damping of the... Unsteady boundary? I have steady boundary condition. Uh, concerning the, the, the input of sediment, yeah, you don't have, to, you do not assume the uh, equilibrium transport. I feed a certain rate and let the system to equilibrate. Yes. I don't change that. There's a catchment that is throwing a certain amount of sediment and a certain amount of sediment. Yes, you feed, but it could be different than the transport capacity. It's different. At, at that time, if the lambda is so short. It adjusts just the, the next uh, space interval. It, it doesn't even reach it. If you do. Yes, so, and so, that's why so you dump everything. Yeah, you dump everything in this case. Because, because of scales, the spatial scales are like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Next question is already in place. Uh, Dave Malan, University of Hull. Uh, I've got a question for Rebecca. Um, I think your, your talk was very uh, thought provoking. And it's good to see that some really good process-based research is being conducted on, on these systems. Uh, my, my question relates um, to the possible role of vegetation. Um, some um, bedrock alluvial systems, I'm thinking of those perhaps in semi-arid areas where it's perhaps the uh, more catastrophic, rare events that are the main um, geomorphic agents. And during the, the periods of more uh, quiescent flow, um, you can get to quite extensive uh, areas of vegetation growing on um, uh, and sedimentation on uh, bedrock areas. Uh, so my, my question, yeah, I mean, you, you didn't mention vegetation in your talk. I just thought that perhaps this is maybe uh, an additional factor that can be considered in, in some systems. So I was wondering if you could say something about the possible uh, effects of vegetation on how the system develop over time, particularly uh, in terms of the way in which the um, vegetation can affect sediment um, uh, accretion, but also subsequent transport when, when there is uh, an event competent enough to remove the vegetation and, and transport sediment. Cool, thanks for that. Um, to be honest, it's a really good question. I, I think vegetation is something that's remarkably absent from the bedrock alluvial literature at the moment, actually. I mean, I, I guess in a lot of systems, the fact that you have potentially quite mobile sediment patches and a lot of bedrock means that there's maybe less potential for um, vegetation to sort of establish and actually take a foothold. But I take your point that I know some of the systems you've been working on, you do get very extensive sediment vegetation growth. So. I wonder if you end up with a system that maybe was a bit more of a transition between a sort of alluvial system whereby the vegetation acts in the way it maybe does in braided channels under low flow conditions, and then maybe in the extreme events, if that all gets stripped off, you then transition to something that operates a bit more like a bedrock system, where you get this sort of enhanced transport capacity um, from the exposed bedrock areas. Um, but yeah, like, I think it's certainly sort of an area that has potential to be looked at. Do, do you think you could incorporate it within your model? Um, you, I mean, you could do. I'm, I'm always slightly hesitant. I sort of get questions about could you put this into the model, that into the model. And I'm always slightly, you could. You can make up rules for almost anything in the model if you wanted to. Um, that's a, a trade-off, though, between how many slightly arbitrary rules you put into the model and kind of what you get out of the model. So although you could do, I think you need to think quite carefully about sort of what it was that you were trying to sort of ask the model by doing that. Um, thank you both for two, two great talks. Uh, I always assume that the organizers of the meetings in their infinite wisdom, when they juxtapose two talks like this, they are sort of presenting us with a puzzle, which is how do you put the two talks together in a meaningful fashion? And uh, perhaps that's an illusion, but I, I'm going to pursue it. Um, so 
uh, Rebecca, you, you, you gave us a really uh, clear perspective on the importance of grain, grain interactions and, and what happens when those grain-grain interactions aren't present, for example, when you have a sort of better bed. And then Enrique, you, it, it seemed to me that your probabilistic uh, representation had sort of an implicit, uh, and, and the answer to the previous question seemed to imply that, that there was an implicit grain-grain interaction a la, you know, the kind of uh, uh, proportional uh, uh, grain size distributions that are implicit in something like a, a or explicit in, in terms of a Wilcock-Crow kind of formulation. And I'm just wondering, is it, is, well, let me say first with Enrique, does, does the fact that the model does not explicitly represent grain-grain interactions, uh, but seems to treat things in terms of this sort of more bulk probabilistic fashion, are you losing some key behavior because of that? And then I would flip it the other way to Rebecca and say, if you were to think of your system in this probabilistic form that, that, that Enrique has given us, does that give you any leverage or advantage in terms of explaining some phenomena? You can answer it in whatever order you choose or not. Yes, and the problem is on the assumption in this model runs, which we have done trying to simplify the whole thing as much as we could. And when we assume that the probability uh, densities of uh, the probability functions of bed elevation fluctuations do not change in time, even during a gradation, that's a big problem. Particularly if you look at the profile where you have a rotation and you have a slope that changes. Uh, in that case, we have that the probability of entrainment and I'm put of deposition, I'm not going to touch it because it has, we, we mathematically show that that depends on entrainment and bed elevation, does not explicitly appear in the equation of conservation of bed material. Then we use Wilcock and Crow type of model, which is Wolf model, and that's why I suspect we end up with that type of course subset. If we have, now, what, what I would like, what, what I'm going to try to do next, we don't, don't get rid of the DDT in terms of probability density of bed elevation, and we have, I have to explicitly account for the probability of entrainment of particles in every single grain size range at a given elevation within the bed deposit. And this is a kind of worms because it depends on the bed load transport regime, for sure, you have bed forms, you don't have bed forms, what sort of bed forms you have, and it depends on grain size. So this function at least has to be conditional on the bed load transport regime that you have, and some sort of relative grain size, di over dg, with dg computed somehow, I don't know, to account for the dispersion of the, an inter the grain grain interaction. the reasons I quite, I quite like CA models, models is it means I don't have to deal with lots of equations. Um, but I guess one of the things that actually is very difficult to construct within that sort of cellular automata framework is actually this question of grain size. And we know that clearly grain, the size selectivity of grain size in training and transport does seem to vary an awful lot as a function of the amount of sediment cover that we have. And quite how you implement that within this sort of discretized cellular model you know, we talked, we talked about grain packing, packing earlier today, it would be sort of a problem like that within each of the grid cell. So clearly that seems that's, that's a question that this framework is actually not really suitable for answering. So a sort of more probabilistic framework may actually well be the way to go for that sort of question. Um. I really, I really like both talks. Thanks, thanks a lot. I liked uh, Gordon's question about <laughs> the particle scale and the importance of things. So, thanks. Um, so uh, sort of in, in some ways, ways a follow on to your questions. Um, I have a question for each of you. Um, Enrica, um, I, I like the model framework a lot, partly because it seems like it has the capability for taking into account different rules for grain scale interactions at the different layers. 
Um, and we've talked about that a little bit. Um, but I have a question about how to do that based on what you showed. And so the different layers um, in particular, you would have different types of segregation behaviors. Um, and in the substrate, what you showed is you have a uniform size distribution in the substrate. Um, and I'm wondering, and I think that, uh, it, do you have the cap? Is that just for like the first step? And do you have the capability of, of like having something in the substrate for you to reflect that, and then uh, reflect that you might have a variability in size? Um, and then, uh, and then the second part of the question has to do with the segregation of the top layer, which is uh, so on the bottom layer might be creeping flow, and the top layer, especially if you have bed forms, you have a spatial, spatially varying um, rule for segregation. Uh, so at the I always get these mixed up, especially the pressure, but least side and stuff side, you know, the, the, there's part of it that's um, like a granular flow flowing down the front of a dune, and then there's a part of it that's more like a hydraulically driven segregation mechanism. And how would you incorporate that spatial variation in the top layer into, into the model? Um, so, yeah. This is an initial condition. Forget about this stuff. This is what the model is predicting. And even though it's too coarse, you have downstream finding and upward coarsening. Now, uh, this was. <laughs> now, for what you're saying, how to do this probabil uh, the probability functions, yeah, it's a matter of on elevation. Well, let's start with the flow. Depending on the bed load transport condition, you will have some sort of bed elevation fluctuations, right? That depend on the bed load transport regime that you have in your channel. So you can have bigger bed forms, so bigger fluctuations, smaller bed forms, smaller fluctuations, same thing in time, longer wavelength or faster bed forms and slower bed forms, and these functions are going to change. So we need a way of relating these probability functions of bed elevation fluctuations to the bed load transport regime and the characteristics of the bed forms that form. Now, in that, at that point, when, let's say that we have a triangular bed form, which is easy. We have that on the source, we have typical bed load transport and avalanching on the lead. The easiest thing that comes to mind on how to combine things is going to be an average, maybe on the length of these bed forms and then dump everything in a magic function that is going to go into the model. So there should be a lot of work in developing these functions before putting them into the numerical model. Make sense? Okay. Um, and uh, Rebecca, a quick comment. comment and then a question. The comment is there's been some um, cellular autonomous models for capturing segregation um, in the granular literature. And they have a way of sort of probabilistically taking into account different sizes. And that might be a way to sort of incorporate that in the next stage. Okay, cool. Okay. And then the question that I have for you involves, um, again, a segregation question for the different levels of cover. Um, in, the, in the granular community, we see that with different amounts of random kinetic energy or granular temperature, you get different segregation rules. And I'm wondering if you see evidence of something like that in segregation in either different bumpiness of the bedrock, where you have little bits of deposits here and there, or um, different amounts of cover. Um, sorry, can <laughs> oh. Does the segregation yeah. change with, with boundary conditions that, that, that you've noticed? Um, so I, I guess it depends on sort of what scale we're talking about segregation at. I mean, we do seem to get, I guess we would expect that over very sort of reach scale, we get segregation in terms of downstream finding, and the sort of differential mobility of the different grain sizes suggests that, again, if you've got a lot of sediment cover, we get those sort of same hiding and sheltering effects that you get in an alluvial system in which case you do seem to get that sort of downstream finding occurring. What we seem to find is when you've got many sort of very mobile grains over bedrock, for some reason those sort of hydrogen and shelving effects don't seem to have the same impact. And again, it seems like maybe the mobility of all the grains kind of overrides that. And we would expect that maybe we wouldn't see that downstream um, sort of segregation in grain sizes. But having said that, to be honest, again, it's another example of not having very much data. There's 
I think almost very little data of where people have actually gone to try and look at sort of how grain size varies downstream in these sort of um, semi-alluvial systems. And the one example I do know of, um, which is on the rivers in Texas, um, is Amanda Keyes-Zerbert did it for her PhD. And I think the problem they had there was they had a lot of sediment coming in. And so although there may have been sort of effects as a result of much sediment cover, actually you need a, you need a really nicely constrained system that ideally has sediment input at the top and then no lateral sediment supplies. And in which case you might actually be able to see, try and sort of identify some of those effects. Uh, for Rebecca, what about channels with bedrock floors and alluvial banks, which seems to describe a lot of the channels around here, actually, except that there may be river out. Um, good question. I guess. I guess, I guess if you've, if you've got, got, I mean, excuse me, if you've got alluvial banks, the main impact I guess they're going to have is if you've got lateral erosion, you're going to have this sort of constant resupply of sediment from the banks. In which case, I mean, I guess that's going to have a number of them. And one, if you've got increasing sediment supply from the banks, depending on how that contrasts to the rate of flux out of the system, you may well find that actually you get quite a lot of sediment cover developing, particularly if we're sort of near that threshold sediment flux initially, you may get that sort of positive feedback, very fast sediment cover developing. And I guess, again, if you've got that sediment cover developing, that may then have implications for things like the mobility of the different grain sizes. Not, again, not, not that I know of. Sorry, no sort of comprehensive data sets. Uh, John Buffington, I have a question for Enrique. Very intriguing results. Um, but my question has to do with the field site. Why did you choose the Trinity? Uh, in particular because the pre dam conditions have a lot of uncertainty about them. And then, maybe I missed this, but uh, is there something about the field site that you're using to validate the model? Okay. I'm going to be super honest. Because I was in a rush and I had data since we have done work there to the Trinity Restoration Project to work on coarse gravel augmentations combining fluoridities from the dam. Now, the problem of the lack of data and the zeroing runs is the problem of doing zeroing runs of morphodynamic models, and this is a serious problem because you need an initial condition. And you not only need an initial condition, you need a model that gives you numbers that make sense. How do you get those? You have equilibrium conditions, which is generally what is used as a starting point um, for an dynamic simulation. So I have a river, I put a dam. OK, how was the river before a dam? Who knows? Generally, you assume an equilibrium condition there, right? And you have very, very limited data to characterize that equilibrium condition. So this is why I say we have four millimeter difference of DG in the subset. Well, great, this is a good result. Because who knows? But you have to leave with this type of uncertainties. And uh, even with this type of uncertainties, if your model is able to reasonably capture some sort of equilibrium state, you can hope that you're producing numbers that have some sort of meaning. If not, well, it's a computer, it's the computer gives something to you, and I don't know how reliable that would be, honestly. And the second part, is it, are, are you validating something about the um, Active layer? Yeah, yeah the, the active layer model was validated with data that David Gauman and the River Reversation Project gave us, and we worked with them to characterize these pre dam conditions in the most possible physically based way we could. So, we, they had uh, work in the upstream of the Trinity Dam to constrain the load, to constrain the grain size distribution. They had two different types of surveys. We did the our own calculations based on old data collected at the old bridge, so we constrain things as best as we could on that river for pre dam conditions. And that's what we don't have, for example, we don't know the surface, the bed surface, the pre dam bed surface, we have no idea. We just know, know that the salmons were happy at that time. Thank you. Thank you both for, for excellent talks. Um, I'm, I'm going to go again to what uh, Kimberly uh, asked before because uh, I, I wanted to ask Enrique what are the 
Yeah, yeah. Length, uh, I mean, the length, length scale of the, the um, spatial scale of your simulation and the time scale of the simulation, because, because regarding the, the, the spa spatial, spatial resolution, and this is, this is the question where I, I want your, your, your input on this, I see the model as an excellent uh, opportunity to really develop a, a more dynamical turbulence model that was discussed in the, in the first talk of ground of the rivers, which was horrible, by the way. Um, and, uh, be, you know, this, um, this idea on having fluctuations that are average uh, in a space, and also if you think that more detailed models, uh, like, like random models, can give some data on the probability distributions of the uh, active layer and things like that. Thank you. Uh, if we, okay, 3D models in these cases, maybe, well, it uh, should, should give us information, information on bed topography, maybe the fine scale, because you solve all the digital solve flow, so, but the problem is, I don't know how good a 3D model and this is what they needs to be done again, are able, are able to, to capture, for example, uh, the bed load transport regime. So given a flow and a feed, you equilibrate your 3D, how well you predict the statistics of the bed elevation fluctuations. If you can capture that, then 3D mod and you need model and experiments for that. At that point, your 3D model can be used to get inf predictions and results on how the probability changes, and the probability then is a function of shear stress and global parameters, and those are the data that would be fed into the large-scale model. This one, I think, kilometer scale. That takes is kilometer scale. That's the key 15 days or longer. It's, it's a completely, it's long, <laughs> it's large. Jens Turowski, um, I'd like to uh, ask less of a question, but make more of an invitation to everybody in the room. And um, this is on bedrock alluvial channels. And one thing um, Rebecca nicely showed in her table of uh, papers that have been published, and that has been also in papers that have been published previously, is that the theory is far advanced over the observations in, in the field of bedrock alluvial channels. And um, we are working at the moment in the literature maybe with a handful of case studies, field studies, where we have detailed data, and another handful where the data is not that de uh, detailed. And um, actually many gravel bed rivers, especially in mountain regions, um, are, have, have bedrock uh, boundaries uh, or have bedrock sections. And I'd, I'd like to invite you all to, to look at your field sites and maybe look at them um, in, in the, within, within the paradigm of a bedrock alluvial section and see maybe we can use the data and the field sites you have, you're working on, you have been working on, to learn something about this type of rivers. So, next question. Bill Dietrich, Berkeley, great talks. I have one, I think, brief question for Rebecca. I think I put my head down taking notes when you said how the cellular autonomous uh, model works. Um, but it, it seems to have a behavior that I'm not sure I've seen. I want to make sure I understand how it works. Um, and that has to do with whether when you form a patch, it moves as a whole. In limited blue experiments I've watched, in glass plates and putting sediment in, you get these patches and then they erode away. They don't migrate as a patch. Now, in your model, it looked like you were creating patches that marched like army ants down the way. And so that, to me, suggests something about how your model set up that does that. So how does, this, how does your patch emergence and migration all that work? Yeah, OK. So the, I guess in the sort of, so in the, the, the way in which patches are migrating downstream when you've got the fluctuating sediment load, it's basically because you're dumping more in the top of the model domain that can actually be transported in a single time step. And so you're getting a certain proportion of grains that are moving off the front of that and then are moving downstream. And so you're getting a sort of constant flux of sediment off the top of that. And eventually you sort of exhaust that point, that sediment sort of wave. And I guess at that point, the back, the sort of end of the wave also starts to move down the, mic, mic, move down the, regi the model regime. So you get this 
So in that, that case, case, you do, do get this patch which moves downstream. But, but, but fundamentally, what's your rule? If, you're, if I'm a particle at the rear end of the patch and I get up, what am I supposed to do at that point? Um, so, so I guess, guess if you're... So, 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 so the, the way in which... The, the, so, so in each cell of the model, you have a number of grains. Okay. Um, there's, four, there's an active layer applied in the model which basically says there's four, la four grains in each cell which can move any other grain in that cell as a mobile. And the reason that that's implemented in the model is in order that the model has some sort of finite transport capacity, which was partly in order, done in order to sort of trying to sort of plot the results on these sort of transport capacity graphs. And you say, okay, and it's not an unreasonable assumption because if the domain is fully alleviated, clearly the flux isn't just going to increase with the depth of sediment in that model. It's going to have some sort of limit. So we say the limit is that four grains in each cell is the most that have a probability of moving. So, so and then one, one of those four grains, basically what we do is you draw random numbers and see so say, okay, the probability of movement is 0.95. If the number is less, greater than 0.95, it doesn't move. If it's less than 0.95, it does move. And so they're sort of been trained probabilistically like that. And then how do you start? Um, so each grain, if, if that grain is selected to be entrained, it moves 10 cell cell lengths downstream, and then it's just deposited. Oh, so, so in each, each time step, they only move a single, they move a single step length. So they go a single step length, and if they're by themselves, they stop, or if they're near something else, they stop? Yeah, but if they're by, if they're by themselves, they then become a sort of isolated grain, so the next time step, they'll have a high probability of entrainment, so they're very likely to then be entrained in the next time step. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank, thank you very, very much, much for a nice, nice discussion, discussion and through nice talks. Thank you. Thank you.